Well, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you for joining the panel discussion here today. So we want to talk uh, about Industry 4.0 in the context of manufacturing engineering. Um, at ex as a case study as part of the E-Prime project, which is a project uh, which is looking at electrification and uh, developing the new skills and processes around that, but also, importantly, the associated digital technologies. Uh, so we've got here on the panel today the consortium partners and also uh, representation from the uh, funding body, the Advanced Propulsion Center. And before we uh, jump straight into the discussion, uh, we've got a, a quick video prepared uh, about the project and uh, the context. So if we start with that, thank you. Henry Ford had a saying, bringing the highway to all mankind, in their own vehicles and shared vehicles, but most importantly in the types of vehicles that society will want them to drive going forward. Pace is changing our industry is unprecedented. Movement towards electrified powertrain means that we have to develop products really quickly, that we are going to be using equipment that moves faster than we expect, and that the amount of lead time that we have to get products to market is much reduced. The E-Prime project is around reskilling the manufacturing engineering team here at Ford and the manufacturing engineering supply base across our consortium partners. The E-Prime project is a big step change for, for the industry. The digital tools, what we call the manufacturing engineering digital twin, has a big capability of visualizing of what are we planning to do and it really allows us to accelerate the time from product design production launch. At the heart of what we do is collaboration. And we train people already on digital equipment uh, that we commission new machines before they're actually physically available. It's a real engineering tool which brings benefit to the whole uh, design and production process. My name is David Wells. I'm Managing Director of JPP Euphoric UK Limited. As part of E-Prime, we're providing the hardware platform against which digital engineering and industry 4.0 initiatives can be tested and evaluated. And we envisage that from that, uh, further development work will, uh, will come out. My name is Andy Hodgson. I'm the strategic sales lead for digitalization for Siemens in the UK. So what we are providing to E-Prime is the digital tools based around the electrification of battery-powered hybrid cars and how we can produce electrical drivetrains to the most efficient way in every variation in every scenario. And any problem we can see can be tested and eliminated in the virtual world. That's what the digital twin can do for us. My name is James Crothers. I'm a product design lead at Signal Knots. We're helping Ford to understand their people, processes and tools. We're visualising various systems and structures to help them understand themselves better and then using those artefacts to interrogate and find opportunities for process improvement and digitization. All of the digital tools should really revolutionize manufacturing, and I think this will really lead to a more streamlined and efficient future for UK manufacturing. Hello, I'm Ian Constance. I'm the Chief Executive of the Advanced Propulsion Center. We aim to make the conditions right for people to invest in R&D here in the UK for advanced automated systems. We do that by providing advice and support as well as funding for large-scale collaborative projects. The Ford-led E-Prime project being a really a prime example of that. So this project wouldn't have happened without the support of the Advanced Proportion Centre. Not only have they brought some interesting ways of funding projects within the UK, but they've also brought a network of people that we're reaching into, so supply base for different types of uh, motor components, um, different academic partners that we can work with and talk to. And that's really powerful. I think you completely underestimated the importance of that network in the UK. OK. Um, Chris, can we maybe start with you as uh, uh, the perspective of the uh, OEM in the project? Um, we've seen that the industry goes through a, a very big shift towards electrification. But at the same time, we're looking at introducing digital tools to help that. And could you give us your perspective? Um, and we, we heard in the in the video about the notion of the manufacturing engineering digital twin. So what do we understand that? And what is the, the OEM perspective from your view? OK, so um, I guess our industry is going through a huge amount of upheaval at the moment um, around electrification. So the product itself is changing. The customer base is changing. The way we all want to drive cars and, and, and move around is changing. Um, 
at the same time, um, that drives a need for us to be faster and smarter in the way that we get there. So the manufacturing engineering process has to change. And so digitization becomes a really important part of that. Um, and that's why we're looking carefully at the digital twin. Um, the digital twin can mean lots of different things. And I'm sure some of you are sitting here thinking about what, what the, the, that you want to hear about a digital twin that matches your part of the, your business effectively. Um, it means something very particular for me within manufacturing engineering. It, for us, it's around we build a system, a very complex system that manufactures components. They used to be internal combustion engines, and in the future, there'll be motors and battery arrays and things like that. Um, and, and we need a way as a group of manufacturing engineers to bring that system together virtually that it works first time. And that's a, that, you know, that can be a tremendous undertaking. Um, and, and that's why it's, it's really important that we create this digital twin of what we're going to build. Because w when we build it, getting it wrong is extremely costly. And of course, it means that we're late to market. And in, in the current climate, that's completely unacceptable. Yeah, maybe we can bring in uh, uh, David from your perspective as a machine tool supplier. Uh, you're a very clo close part in that manufacturing engineering process. Um, what, what, what is, is, is your take as a, as a supply chain partner? Uh, yeah, from, from our point of view, we're able to uh, contribute and understand more of the, uh, the global um, assembly package that, uh, that goes into putting a, a facility together, and we have to provide information for that. Um, but from a, a, a company point of view, we're, we're using the information, or hopefully using the information to help us speed our products to delivery. So to help that supply chain. Um, the, there are uh, a, a number of, um, of different um, uh, barriers that are, that are involved in that, which I think we'll talk about a bit later. But essentially, it's what we've seen from the E-Prime project is we've got, uh, a, we've got an ideal opportunity to explore the use of the technologies in our environment and how they impact our, uh, our customers and uh, our end users. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if we want to bring in the, the, the tools perspective, Andy, from a, uh, a tool supplier, is it, do you want to, your take on the, what is the manufacturing engineering digital twin okay. in, in your view in the, in the program? As Chris said, there's almost every, everybody in the room will have a different idea of what a digital twin is and it seems to provide the tools for the whole spectrum. Uh, from the product uh, design, through the process design, through the factory design. So we've got a whole spectrum of projects and uh, products and software um, <coughs> material that we can actually use to de deliver almost any solution, in any, in any digital twin. What EPRAM we're doing is actually exploring the capability. So we're looking at um, you know, fa um, Ford Division who are uh, well used to producing internal combustion engines taking five, six, seven years out of how to do this from a concept through to job one. How can we reduce that? How can we make it more efficient? How can we apply digital tools to improve that process, but not do it with an internal combustion engine that we all know is you know, past its uh, f uh, fashionable date, should we say? <laughs> uh, but let's do electrification, because electrification is the future. We are all going to be driving electric cars. So if we're going to look at a process of delivering an electric drivetrain and a process to improve that, then let's look at the tools. So the digital twin of the products is already developed. So let's look at the process and the, in, and the uh, factory manufacturing. So uh, we're looking at how we can actually go from concept through to design, but then we're looking how we can design the factory. So we're looking at the virtual commissioning and the digital twin of the machine, the cell, the line, the simulating that to see how quickly we can go from a concept through to a completed finished line that's producing parts for an dr electric drivetrain. Um, so in, in the consortium, James, as part of uh, Signal Noise, I think you classify yourselves as a, as a data design uh, company. Yeah. Can you maybe explain to the audience what that means and what your, your view is? Uh, so essentially we help uh, our customers understand the data they have or we help them um, understand the processes and so on. So we dig in and find data inside of their organizations. I think from my point of view, the interesting thing with the, the digital twin is it is ultimately a tool or a collection of tools. We don't actually really know what they, they look like at the moment, really, or rather what it's going to look like in five, ten years' time, um, as everybody has a different view of what that, what that means. But I think it's, it's understanding how the people, ch uh, the way that they work changes with the tool because 
having a digital twin means you've got to work and, and understand differently. You've got data that's uh, very binary in terms of yes and no and that kind of thing at your fingertips. So how do people change the way they work? Okay. Um, Ian, as you, as the APC is, is funding that, that program. Can you give us a, maybe your, your perspective on the project and maybe also for the audience who are interested, how can people get involved um, uh, with, with the APC? In, in yeah, um, I think this is a, a, a really good project. Uh, as I said in the video, what we do is uh, we fund large-scale uh, projects, late-stage uh, R&D projects, and our aim is to build supply chains uh, in the new generation of technologies coming along for propulsion systems, particularly around automotive. So a project that uh, is developing the process, methodology, and know-how on electric motors for uh, EVs is, is right in the heart of what we want to do. What I really like about this project is that it is about process, it's about manufacturing, and it's about bringing that manufacturing uh, knowledge and capability uh, to bear in, in a potential large-scale large volume uh, situation. I think in the UK, we're very inventive, we're very innovative, we've known that for many years, but I think we've failed on so many occasions to uh, put that inventiveness and that innovation to work in the industrial concept, uh, uh, in, 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 in the industrialization, and these ideas and innovations end up going overseas. And I think a lot of that is because I don't think there's a great breadth of understanding in, with the powers that be about what scaling things in, a, in an industrial manufacturing con context and, and certainly the next generation of manufacturing looks like. So because this operates very much in the heart of that, um, I think it's an absolutely terrific program and project and I think we want to do more things like this. Mm -hmm. Your second point about collaboration, uh, the Advanced Propulsion Center sits on a, a billion pound uh, commitment between government and industry to invest in these technologies and to build this supply chain for the future. And uh, I can tell you having a billion pound to give away uh, gets you a lot of friends quite quickly. <laughs> and it's that ability then to organize those people who want to be your friend because you've got some money to give away and to, to find the right collaborators and to put them into collaborative pro programs and, and build those networks, those broader networks, that's really key to, I think, what we do and how we add value beyond just, just funding things. Mm. Yeah, maybe I'd like to just pick up that last point about the, the, the collaboration. I mean, we see here uh, we've got uh, various different partners working together, and I think it, it, it mentioned earlier as well that the... The, the way we work together uh, could, could change by the use of those uh, digital uh, technologies and that manufacturing engineering digital twin, as we, as we call it. Um, can we just quickly go in where you see, maybe we, if we start off with, uh, maybe with Chris and, um, and, and David, on where, where you see the, the collaboration, maybe within the company, but also externally, might change through the use of the digital tools. Um, so... With, it, with using a digital, tw digital tool, one of the things that I think the various discussions today have talked about is some of the traditional things that we've always wanted, like problem solving and decision making in engineering, are actually amplified by these tools. So um, when you're presented with a digital version of the factory you're going to build, then it's really obvious what's wrong, what could be better, what could be improved, what you want to change and those discussions are really rich and actually driving that to a decision to a direction quickly in the in the heart of the moment is is, is going to be a critical skill you know it, it and from a collaboration perspective um the way we can collaborate globally you know the, these tools can obviously be used in multiple locations they can be used between um, suppliers and customers and um, they can be used throughout the throughout the supply chain so with all sorts of people to get advice very very quickly so so the collaboration becomes more rich but it also becomes much more intense yeah David do you want to, to add to that yeah yeah to um, if, if we look at our 
contribution to, uh, to the overall scheme of things. We're looking at the detail, the detail of the equipment that goes into the larger picture or the bigger picture. Um, and that has challenges for us. Um, one of them, for instance, is uh, to, to give over to our, our customers um, a, a full CAD model of our equipment. That gives away a lot of our IP. And we've, we've managed through a collaboration uh, and the way that we've set up to work on, on this project to come up with a, a way using CAD, uh, CAD tools to simplify the model give enough information for the, for the overall picture and the, and the digital twin to work, but also to protect our IP. So th there's a lot of things behind uh, putting together a whole system and, and using the technologies which are out there. Um, if you like the political uh, side of things, the human side of things that we need to address, I think, before fully get into full use of, uh, of, of the technologies. Um, for us, uh, another, another area, looking at the detail, in, in our own company, what we, what we want to use it for is actually modeling and predicting cycle time. At the end of the day, you don't really know the cycle time of the machine until, um, and, until the machine's built. Now, if we can do that up front on the, on the drawing board, as it was, um, and know what we're going to get when the machines run off, that's, that speeds up our process. It gives us first time through, much more benefit out of first time through, better quality, better reliability. But to get that information, there's a cost. Uh, how do we access the real live data that, uh, uh, that needs to be fed into that from the working environment? So there's got, there's got to be a collaboration and working with our, our uh, customers to be able to pull that information into the company and use it. So, so there are many aspects to, uh, to using the technologies that I think are there, are almost there, but the refining and the, and the detail of them. Um, and if, if I can also invite uh, questions through the app, uh, through Slido, if you want to. Uh, so we've got the, the app next to us, if you want to contribute to it. But if you, um, I think that from uh, uh, James and, um, uh, and, and Andy, on the, on the collaboration point of view, I think I know, um, uh, James, you looked at it from using different processes, how people can mm. work together within the project. And so yeah, so I think the, the digital twin, it, it changes the way that people work together both internally and then obviously across between a, a supplier and so on. Um, I think it also it, it changes the immediacy of all the, the decisions that you're making. Um, if, if we look at a digital twin, which is incredibly complex potentially, um, those decisions that it's gonna give you or, or help you make still need to be understood. Um, and that, that's still a factor and that's still gonna be a challenge. You can't, it's not just gonna give you a yes or a no. Or if it does give you a yes, you, you need to understand the probably very complex thing that it's, it's trying to explain. So, so yeah, as, as Chris alluded to, it's, uh, it's one thing kind of expediting decisions, but th it, that does have a knock-on effect about how people work. From a seamless point of view, what you may all be thinking, you know, what's new? You've heard all these projects been discussed today. The digital twin's been talked about by almost every speaker that's uh, sat on the stage today. Uh, what's new is, well, firstly, this is a project. We're normally, we're working with Ford. We have a job one. We have a time. There's investment in a factory. You've got to get, start making cars or engines. In this project, we have an end goal. But how we get there is down to the consortium to decide how we get there. So it's a bit of a sandpit. We can play with ideas as long as the goal is achieved. The second one is, you, we all think what a great idea would be to have a collaborative space where the supply chain whether it's um, Siemens or whether it's JW Frolic, can work with our customer Ford on the same environment, in the same workspace, sharing the same data. We can do this in this project because it's not a critical job one project that has to go out and make engines with by January 2020. And the third one, as everybody sat through today, you realize that the technology is there, the end user is there, the appetite is there for industry four technologies, but what's really missing is adoption. It's how to bring the people into the program, how to upskill, how to adopt, how to knock down the barriers. And that's the difference with signal noise. What they're bringing to us is a complete tangential point of view of what is the barriers? What do people on the shop floor really want to see from the data? It's all right collecting gigabytes of data. It's all right analyzing them. But what you actually do with that data to make a better product faster with higher quality is down to the people actually running the lines and running the operation. And what SignalNoise are doing for us, and that's what's different to, to us, is analyzing how we take our tools to market and how we use them. Not what we do with them, but how we actually apply them. I think, 
interestingly, one of, the, one of the questions that kind of bounced around the room in the prior panel was, um, what do we do about skilling the people that we have today? Um, I think you know th th there's a lot of focus and attention, rightly so, going on the future, on schools and on university. Um, but my problem clearly, rather selfishly, is now I've got a team of people who understand how to develop facilities for a technology which is dying, internal combustion engines. How do I move them on quickly? Um, the digital twin will help us with that. Um, but it, it, it's kind of projects like this that will address that, not necessarily um, processes of education, taking people back out to university, clearly in my case is going to be difficult. This type of project has really allowed us you know, to have that opportunity to collaborate um, and, and, and using a digital twin, actually, even for people of mature years, is a really natural way of visualizing where we're going um, because that's, that's foreign to us. We don't necessarily know this type of facility, this type of technology, but it's really helped to accelerate us towards that's, what, that's where we're going. That's, that's what we need to do. I think I'll, I'll add to that in that, you know, it's <laughs> all of these things are just tools and mm. how many tools get deployed and then people don't know how to use them and they fail. And I think this project really helps. It gives the time to be able to understand how these things work uh, and, and not have things just be put in and, and, and end up failing. Yeah, we, we just uh, had the point about how we, we work together and um, I think there, there just popped up a question on what was the catalyst of bringing all together. Um, uh, Ian, and apart from the funding, I know you, you do much more on um, bringing UK industry together and could you, could you explain the other activities or yeah, on sure. how, how that fits in? On so um, we have uh, a number of programs that we run. So first of all, there's the, the large scale projects of which this is one of them. And those are typically, they are all collaborative R&D. They are late stage projects. So they'll be after proof of concept. So you might say after TRL five or, or, or six, if you're talking that language. And they should, they should end up, they should aim to end up with a, a, a product in mind. We can't fund past R&D, so we can't fund into production. Uh, but that's where, where we're talking. The project at the small end of 5 million and at the high end, they're 40 million pounds. They typically last three or four years. And these uh, projects will be collaborative in, in nature. They will have a route to market. So they'll have somebody like a Ford or another OEM or a large scale t um, uh, tier one uh, activity supplier who's saying that I want to take something to market. So that's where the majority of our funding and our effort goes, but there's some other things as well, and, 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 and again, supporting this idea of, of collaboration. So first of all, we have a program called TDAP. That's where we um, support small technology developers who have an idea and they want to bring it into this space. It's, very, it's very difficult to break into the automotive supply business, so we help them uh, develop their technology to a point where they can have a proper discussion and then we put them into inject them into our network and as I say we've got a lot of friends because we've got a lot of money to give away so uh, that enables us to uh, inject people into that network we do a lot of work around building networks so we have uh, what we call our spokes around the uh, strategic technologies so those are electric motors and power electronics their batteries or energy storage systems we still look at engines because we think engines have still got a role to play in this world, but we're looking for the big advances in engines, um, as well as lightweighting and lightweight systems, so, um, and digital engineering as, a, as an end to itself. So those areas, we have spokes where we build networks of collaborators. Those are people in academia, people in industry, um, and, and, and suppliers, small and large, to get them together to enable them to bring together groups like this one who want to do things and push things forward. Um, so those are some of the key things we do. We, we also take uh, groups out on international um, um, activities where we go to things like Japanese Society of Automotive Engineers in May and we'll take 20 companies, put them on a stand and introduce them to people in Japan, we do similar things in the US and Germany. So there's a few of the things that we do. Thank you. 
I think that answers also some of the, the first question, which comes up, what was the catalyst for bringing us all together? Um, was the networking event competition? I mean, what's a competition on here? I think catalyst, if I try to start answering it, was truly the, the challenge, what we want to achieve. Um, and I think what was the benefit of, of this? I'm not sure if, you, if some of the panelists want to, to have a start at the question, the, uh, uh, the benefit of, 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 of that. Uh, project uh, together? I think obviously the, the, the prime aim of the project is the skills transition of our teams. Um, so that's clearly the main benefit. Um, but so much more has come out of it for us. Um, we're a year into a three year project. <laughs> um, the network part of it was something that I completely underestimated. Um, Ford's a global company has a hell of a lot of resource around the world and will tend to work in quite an insular way normally. Um, this actually forced us to work and think in a different way. So, you know, it was a, normally a customer supplier relationship. We have a very collaborative uh, relationship with, with, with Frolic here. So we're understanding from their perspective what the issues are and coming up with kind of win-win solutions um, to a lot of the problems, but also Beyond that, the APC have put us in touch with an awful lot of people doing other projects. Um, so there are many other people not necessarily working on the same thing, certainly not working on the same type of project, but actually um, real adjacencies, real opportunities to talk to people, um, going through similar experiences, um, have, had similar sol have had solutions to some of the problems that we've already encountered. And then also, the network of people out there who have capability in this country is far greater than I expected. So um, finding the last UK manufacturer of copper wire to go into our motors, um, who's kind of just been clinging on, right, for this automotive upsurge on, on, on drives, and now it's here, and, and, and having that discussion was, yeah, okay, th there might be some opportunity for business, but the other key part of it was, actually this is what's important, this is what you need to bake into your design, these are the things that we control, these are the things that you have to control. That opportunity to, to have that rich level of dialogue was something that we just don't normally have. So I think real good opportunities from that perspective. Um, yeah, so we, we talk... Yeah, uh, Can I just pick up on that? I think that's a really good point. Wh one of the areas that we recognize as well is that this new supply chain is really a system. It needs to have the OEMs at the top, it needs to have tier ones, and it has to have these tier, tier ends, like this copper supplier. And our uh, supply chain has been hollowed out over a number of years. So it's really important that through this kind of work, um, we are able to you know, get these people, this copper wire manufacturer and others like them into our network and understand where they fit in so that we can build this whole system up. This isn't going to just happen by itself without some kind of intervention. So I think that's a great example of how these things can go back into the loop and come around and, and support the, the broader aims. Um, so that was a question, how long did the project take from start to finish? So we are, it's a three-year three, three year project, we're one year in, so it's a two years to go. Um, so it might be good to, to talk about, uh, we talked about the ambition of um, what the manufacturing engineering digital twin does for us, for the oper operation, for efficiencies, for collaboration. Um, but if we look at the different potentially barriers or, or opportunities we see, what is the, um, yeah, what, what could we share with the audience on what potentially could be barriers or, or opportunities at the same time? I, I think, I spoke about it, the, 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 the misunderstanding of Digital Twin um, at every level in the company, or your companies too, <coughs> is, is a barrier, right? And, and it's taken me probably the, the whole of the first year to get over the fact <coughs> that we're doing a Digital Twin of our manufacturing engineering system. There are people in my organization who are building Digital Twins of our vehicles, both so that they can test them and make sure they're right before we start you know, physically having metal to worry about, but also digital twins that will enable us to service and support those vehicles in their lifetime. And then there are people in my organization too who are thinking about a digital twin of the factory 
that will enable the people one day who run it to predict how it's going to react when we make a change and actually manage the factory through a kind of symbiotic simulation. So there are lots of digital twins out there and I think kind of the, the, the key important thing to recognize is define yours, make sure people are really clear it's not this all-encompassing digital world where everything is a true representation of everything everybody in your organization wants to do. I think we're a long way from getting to that point. Maybe it'll happen one day. But right now, people are digitizing parts of their business that make sense to them. Mm. Andy, from a, a, a tools perspective, various and opportunities where you, where you see, see that. The opportunities are to showcase what we can do. We have all these tools out there. They're all available. Um, but they're also to a very high-end market. Uh, aerospace and automotive have been doing several of these, you know, um, this ca uh, capability for many years. But how do you get it down to the OEMs and how do you get it down to the supply chains? And this is our way of actually saying this is not just a high-end uh, application. This is not just for the rich and famous, for the blue chips and the massive uh, c uh, global conglomerates. It's for the supply chains, for the OEMs, for the manufacturers, and the, for everybody to get involved in. But to do that, you can say that, so you got blue in the first with PowerPoints and catalogs, but you actually need to show people and let people experience it and see use cases. So, for instance, we're working on a digital twin of one of the machines with Frolic, virtual commissioning, building the machine virtually and testing it, incorporating all the control, the PLCs, the drives. But one of the users is showcase to show other machine builders that it is for them, it is capable, it does save time, it does make a better product and faster. So the opportunity for us is to s show the world that everybody can be digital, not just the, the big blue chips. David, do you want to from a... Yeah, and, and from, um, from that exercise, um, there's a question up there saying, you know, how do we, uh, like all models, the, uh, the inaccuracies. I mean, that's what we want to see out of it. Just really, where is the reality against the, uh, against the virtual and what's the gap? What, what do we have to do to, uh, to close that gap? Because we can definitely see uh, benefits in, in uh, uh, concurrent engineering, as mentioned earlier, first time through, improving uh, efficiency. And, and also from a customer point of view, um, actually running, and our, our, our peace of mind, running machines off virtually without the customer coming to see us. Um, so, uh, there's a, there's a lot of potential benefits in, uh, in using the technologies, but you know, where are we against the, the reality? Uh, so, um, I th and I think what we're doing it within E-Prime and the collaboration and quite working quite openly and quite honestly with, uh, with the partners, we're setting the platform to start to see that. James, do you, do you, do you um, want to, what, what barriers, you, see, you looked at earlier on the more the human side of it and how people um, yeah, interact with it. I think yeah. we had some of that discussion earlier on in some of the uh, presentations as well, that there are difficulties with actually how people in, engage with that. Is, so did you I see I a th barrier there? Or uh, yeah, so there's obviously, I think as Chris said, you've got to understand what, what the digital twin is going to tell you, but also what it doesn't tell you, um, and, and how do you communicate that? Um, that, that's going to be the biggest thing. And for, from our point of view, the benefit of, of working this at the moment is understanding what a digital twin actually is, being able to actually work on a live project that is actually using it. Um, and hopefully we can help understand how those things get communicated. Um, there there's a, a question um, from, from the audience as well. Um, on the, um, yeah, like, like all my dig digital twins have inaccuracies, how can we convince leaders that predictions be trusted before validating that they truly reflect reality? Um, how, yeah, how, how we go about inaccuracies and, and how, how do we make the business case, I guess, understand it for, for implementing it? Is um, well, I guess um, visually, um, our, our digital twin is quite apparent, so we're having a lot of conversation. I think you saw some of the footage in the video around, around how our facility will look immediately, and there's a level of visualization that I'm able to give my leadership um, about that facility that previously I've never been able to do. So they're on board immediately. I start showing them something like that. So to be able to sit in a room and talk about 
So this is what it's going to look like, this is what it's going to feel like in this facility and drive an even richer discussion about what that, sh what that should and shouldn't be. Um, it doesn't take long to actually get them on board. Um, the issues around accuracy are, are important though. Um, we have to strike a balance between the, the level of detail that's in that, in that digital twin. We could spend an awful lot of time being incredibly accurate to the point where you know every element of the CAD in that machine moves the way it will as a machine and that there's a CNC program behind that that's driving it to do that. The weight of that model, the time to develop that model is completely um, disproportionate to what we need to do. And so it, it will always be about striking that balance. Um, and, and over time, I guess we're going to learn to do that. Part of this project is, is certainly about understanding that. Um, but I can tell you that today's level of first time through on our facilities, when from an engineering perspective, about getting things right, is incredibly low. We have a, you know, we, we start at a very low place. You know, it's not uncommon for us to find us putting down a whole manufacturing facility and finding that a column from the building clashes with it. Um, now, in a digital world, that should not be possible. So the opportunities to improve are already there. I don't, I don't personally think I have to go a long way to demonstrate to my leadership that we're going to be more accurate than we are today. Mm. Um, from a supply chain perspective, David, uh, on the, um, do, do you want to comment on how to make the business case for, for, for that kind of uh, new investment? Yeah, I'd, uh, I think um, it's a good question. It's not an easy question to answer. The, um, I, I think you can see the, the potential benefits, and they, they are in uh, um, shorter lead times and, and more accuracy. I think I've touched on those. But, but I think really there's, you know, there's some hard yards to win, uh, and we've got to go through... Uh, through the steps and see how um, how beneficial it can be. And there has to be then, that, which uh, Chris mentioned, we, we, we have to look at the cost versus uh, the, the reward uh, side of the, of, uh, of, of the question as well. So still a lot to answer. It's uh, I think it's kind of uh, one of the things is I think the question alluded to how do you convince leaders? Um, it's, it's a case of, you know, if you put garbage into the tool, it's not going to come out right. So <laughs> you've got to look at your processes about how you're going all the way from doing the very sort of basic data input um, to then trusting the tool that it's actually giving you the right answers. Um, and that's really the only way they're going to actually trust the, the output of the digital twin. Um, Ian, there, but there was a question on uh, what is the criteria to apply for the APC funding or are there... Um, what's the maximum you provide per project? Do you want to maybe give a bit of um, an overview on how, how that works for people? Well, yeah, I think, I, think well. I sort of covered that before. I mean, uh, the minimum size of our project is five million pounds, and uh, that's half funded by government and the industry partners bring in the other half of the funding in. The maximum size is 40 million, again, 50, up to 50-50. Uh, funding and what happens is we do uh, typically we will have three rounds of funding every year um, and we will invite people to come with their projects meeting the scope around those technologies that I mentioned before so uh, automotive propulsion related uh, technologies uh, electric machines um, power electronics um, engines where that engine is making a step change um, uh, batteries and lightweight systems, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and we have three funding rounds. People will bid into those uh, on a system. Uh, we can support uh, people with their bid writing processes, and uh, we're happy to do that and give them advice. They have to then go through a value for money thing, which is about what economic benefit they'll bring back to the UK, and that's about building these supply chains or putting in place large-scale R&D kind of capability. Um, and then uh, should they be successful, we hope to get things going very quickly. The, uh, we don't look to own the IP. That's with the collaborators. That's with the consortia to decide who brings what and who takes what away. Um, and typically, there'll be uh, between two and four collaborators, sometimes more, sometimes five or six, uh, on, on the various projects. I think, I think it's worth saying um, we 
on the digital, digital twin um, that we see from an automotive council perspective, we're very uh, tightly uh, organized with the automotive council, that the need for digital twins and the, uh, and, and the importance of them will, is only going to grow significantly in the automotive industry. The products are getting much, much more complex and this serial process of design, test, uh, uh, refine and launch is, uh, is not working as you get this tighter, tighter um, uh, impact of, of electronics with physical systems. And so um, your point about getting people to trust them, this is an, uh, inevitably a cycle that we have to go through, but it is absolutely a track that we are on and will not reverse. Yeah, I agree. I, maybe I can pick up by combining some of the questions. There was, uh, what are the, the findings at the moment, efficiency, um, and also how do we determine ROI? Um, um, it, it's definitely, as you say, you know, when we go on that on a, on a journey, which is uh, absolutely a high priority, and so we're one year in, there are another two years to go. So if we look in the future, where do we see the, the, the journey going? Where if we were to look 24 months ahead, um, where, where do you see the project or where do we see the technology being uh, in, in 24 months? If I can open that to the, to, to the panel to have a view a little bit in the glass. Well, glass I, I guess I should, I, the, the top it? question. Oh, right? sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, where I want to be is driving an EV. Um, <laughs> and, and clearly, we're not there yet. Um, and, and, and from a Ford Motor Company perspective, that's because they're not cheap enough, right? Um, and there's so much technology under the bonnet of a hybrid vehicle. You know, you've got everything you've got in a current ICE engine. So, you know, it, 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 it's impossible. You know, I opened the video by saying it was about bringing the highways to all mankind. It's impossible to bring customers the EV experience at the moment at the prices that we all want. And so, you know, that's where I want to be in 24 mm. four months' time, positioned to be able to do so. Um, the project is about skilling people to be ready for that so that when we start to build EV products in the UK or in Europe and, 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 and they go into vehicles at the rate we think it's going to happen, um, you know, we're ready. In 24 months' time, we'll be able to take that ball and really run with it um, because I think it will come far faster than people are predicting, people inside my company or, 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 or the politicians. And, and so we have to be ready and that's, that's really what I'm expecting. The views from pan panel to in 24 months' time. I know we're now running over time now, but um, other other views. Where, where are we going to be as a, as a project? From a seamless point of view, a showcase of capability to show that the manufacturing uh, um, base of the UK is it can be digital and it is accessible to all. Yeah, from our point of view, um, be, being able and, and uh, capable to easily add information into, uh, in, into the digital twin uh, and for that to be used within a customer base. And then also to evaluate the question of, of uh, return on investment because that still has to be answered. I think from our point of view, it's just understanding all the, the processes involved in running a digital twin. Pretty simple as that. And I'm hoping that uh, this will spawn another project where Ford will, with these collaborators, are putting large-scale EV production into Dagenham and Bridge End. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, that's um, the, the 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 time we had for 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 this afternoon. But th thank you very much for 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 joining us uh, here at the panel this afternoon. Thank you all the panelists for uh, for for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.